Welcome to Vermont PBS virtual event from Lydia's Kitchen to yours, a live Q&A with Lydia Bastianich. This event is sponsored by Stowe Kitchen Bath and Linens, offering a well-curated and complete range of home furnishings and seasonal holiday decor located on the Mountain Road in Stowe. And the holidays are all about celebration, joy, and deliciousness. That's where we come in. Visit Healthy Living's newest location at 129 Market Street in Williston. I'm Melissa Passanen, a cookbook author and staff writer at Seven Days Newspaper. I've been lucky enough to write about the food and agriculture scene in Vermont for the past 20 years. And tonight I am lucky enough to be your host for the next hour with chef and restaurant amazing person, Lydia Bastianich. We'd love to have your questions for Lydia. So please type them in the chat along with your first name and where you're joining us from. And we will get to as many as we can. Okay, without further ado, let's welcome Lydia to Vermont PBS. Thank you, Buonasera. Pleasure to be with you, you and all the viewers. Thank you we for having here, me. Sir. We are here in a little bit of snowy Vermont. We were talking, Lydia does not have snow yet in New York. And I am eating a bowl of delicious beet risotto with a Vermont goat cheese and a little bit of balsamic from Lydia's latest cookbook, right, for Lydia? Which you can yes, see how yes. marked up. And Absolutely. We're going to start by hearing a little bit from Lydia about her latest projects, both TV and book. Well, Melissa, I'm working, I'm just finishing. I just, uh, we actually did the photographs and so we're in the editing process of the next cookbook, which will come out uh, in the fall of 2021. And it is uh, about, you know, uh, given the situation, ever more people are spending time in the kitchen, then they're connecting with food and, uh, you know, the simplicity, they want simplicity and goodness of food in cooking at home. So this book, uh, uh, I kind of focused on that theme, the message of, you know, cooking, uh, I mean, one pot, everybody's talking about a one pot cook, but uh, uh, but it actually, these, these recipes that are all together, the vegetables, the proteins, the herbs and everything in one pot really makes sense. It makes sense because the vegetables, uh, uh, get the flavor of the proteins, the proteins get the flavor of the vegetables and it makes the sauce, but not only cooking in a pot. Yeah, I have a lot of the recipes coming out. You can use the oven, you know, like a, a one a, a roasting pan. And in the roasting pan, you can put pork chops and then you put broccoli or Brussels sprouts, some onions and all of that. And you season it all, you put it in the oven and you roast it and you have your roasted vegetables, you have your roasted meat. You can do it with chicken. Again, chicken, onions and peppers and, and potatoes and all of that, season it well. The question is, you know, you season it well, put the herbs and then you put it in the oven and uh, uh, the potatoes, the chicken, everything gets done. And sort of the, the, the flavors, uh, it, they transport from one, one product to the other. So this is this is the next book uh, and uh, it's simple, straightforward uh, with a lot of pictures. So we're excited about it. It's gonna be out in fall 2021. And uh, uh, the other thing that I, even today, I just kind of finished doing a little uh, taping. Uh, you know, I my, my show, my cooking show, uh, I, every year I, I produce 26 episodes and uh, by October, uh, they, they're, they're launched in October, and uh, this year uh, was difficult because, you know, we couldn't go to the studio, we couldn't set it all up. So I did a lot of the recipes, again, from uh, that book that I, I, that's coming out. Yeah, I said, okay, I'm going to simple, straightforward, and I cooked in my garden under the, the wine trestle. So people will have an opportunity. I, it's airing now if you're watching that is my garden, that is my home. And so that was very exciting, it was simple. And of course there was some editing in of uh, cooking segments that I've done before uh, within that. But the, the thrust of it is me talking, uh, being interviewed in my garden, uh, under uh, close to the fig tree, under the wine trestle, you know, like kind of a little Mediterranean. 
And another thing, you know, I'm keeping busy because, you know, uh, the restaurants, some of them are closed still, which is a shame and we can talk about that. But uh, I'm, I'm just uh, finishing uh, Lydia Celebrates America. And that's a special that I do every year. And it's about an hour long. It is an hour long and usually comes out in December. This is my seventh uh, special. But this, this year is all about celebrating and honoring the first responders. Now, we had the idea, you know, because we planned it a year and a half to thank the first responders before the pandemic and how appropriate, but, but it was difficult to film because, you know, usually when I film, I go, I meet the people, I interview them, we cook together, we eat together. And now it, it, this, this one, it all had to be done uh, with with the internet, but you know what? I think it's 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 a great great show. So it should air on on PBS stations across the country uh, between uh, the second week in 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 January or so. That's great. I think the one pot meals or one dish meal sounds like right up the alley, and I'm sure we'll have some questions from folks who have been cooking more at home, as many people have. But you mentioned restaurants. So let's talk a little bit. You're in New York City, which is one of the restaurant destinations of the world, definitely of America. How are you feeling about how restaurants are gonna pull through this pandemic? I, I think a lot of them are just gonna fall off the, the, the sides and you know not reopen. And I think a, a big percentage, I mean, 30 to 40%, I would venture to say. I know, you know, we have what, about uh, eight restaurants in the city and we have, we just opened our third one. The other ones are not open because, you know, it just doesn't make sense uh, because you have to have, you know, okay, outside eating, dining. But if our restaurant and some of them are on main roads or in the midtown, uh, midtown is empty. You know, a lot of people are not working. Uh, uh, we have on the in the uh, on the west side in the theater district. Theater district is closed, and so you know you can only uh, sit twenty five percent now inside, and you just can't. Uh, you know you can't pull through uh, with with those numbers. So you know, uh, sadly you can't hire people and then not have work for them. So it, it is, we, we're really hoping and praying that, uh, uh, yeah, even ourselves, I don't know if we will reopen all of our restaurants, uh, hopefully, you know, uh, most of them, and uh, we'll try to, to go on and, and pull ahead, you know. But we are veterans. I mean, I'm in the restaurant industry 50 years. Some of these people have just began a year or two, put all the money that they have, got into debt, and uh, you know, they can't get out of it now. Right, it's gonna be really interesting to see what happens. So let's look back at Felidia. And you mentioned um, you have a, a new autobiography out, right? But, yes. <laughs> so when you opened Felidia with your then husband, you also had two young children. How did you do that juggle? So many parents right now in pandemic times are juggling family and work like never before. How was it for you back then? Well, uh, you know, uh, I do have uh, my, my biography, the autobiography, My American Dream. It came out last year and I'm very proud. And it goes through my whole story. You know, people are very interested in this. I, I'm 22 years on public television. So, you know, you develop almost like a family, a following, people feel connected. They want to know, they write to me about their family, what they're doing, send me pictures, and they want to know about my family. And I bring as much as I can of my family on the show. You know, grandma, she's 99. She she lives with me. She's still with me. We just, just she just had her supper uh, and uh, she went upstairs. She's watching the Italian news, you know, but but she 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 lived with me uh, in that crucial time when we first opened restaurants. You know, we sort of moved together. Now, for us Italian living together, it's kind of normal. You know, <laughs> we we the family is always very close, and uh, she always had her own apartment uh, in our house. Even now, she has it. Uh, uh, and uh, when when we had the children. It was a blessing because, you know, uh, she would take over when I would go to work. She would also, when they got bigger, you know, 
take them from school, come down to the restaurants, they would do their homework, eat dinner, and then she would take them home to sleep while I continue working. So I was blessed in having her and my father, then my father passed away, but the support, the family support uh, of, of uh, you know, helping me uh, raise my children, maintain my house and all of that. And that's the only way I could have done it. And, you know, today, uh, Melissa, I get asked a lot by women, you know, uh, it's difficult, how do we do it? Well, you know, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, if you really want to do something, you have to find a way, but you do have to have a support uh, base that, uh, you know, organize yourself to, to have a support. It could be, you know, you could pay for it, it could be the family, it could be somebody, but something that, but, uh, you know, I always tell the women, if you have a passion, don't don't let it slide by, you know, make an effort, do maybe uh, less to begin with, do small part-time or whatever, then slowly get into it, uh, you know, because you are an individual, you have a life and you have to respect that too. Yes, and I think you observed this in something I read that your children will see that their parent is following their passion. You, you, you know what, uh, Melissa? I'll, I'll go into little details, which is all in my, in my uh, uh, memoir. Uh, when uh, I had I had Joseph, which is my firstborn, and he was uh, two years old, uh, three years old when we opened Felidia, when we opened the first restaurant. And, uh, you know, I got pregnant, things happened. And uh, uh, Tanya, my daughter was born in the, in the first year that we opened the restaurant. So, you know, here we were, a new restaurant with loans, with, I was helping my husband uh, in the kitchen. I was in the kitchen, he was up in the front. And when I had the baby, of course I had to stay home. You know, I wanted to stay home, you wanna nurture. And uh, then, you know, the sort of going back to work, when am I going to do that? How am I going to do that? So I was a little bit preoccupied and, uh, you know, it kind of uh, uh, tormented me. So I went to the pediatrician. They didn't have psychiatrists in that time, you know. I went to the pediatrician. I said, listen, uh, you know, I, 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 I want to be home. I want to stay with the baby. I want to raise the baby. But in the meantime, you know, we have so many loans and I promised my husband I would help. Uh, you know, what is your advice? What does, what is a mother to do? And, and so, and so he said, you know, remember, he was such a wise man. He said, Re remember, children are born into a family. The family shouldn't change completely because a child is born. The child is born into a family. And that is the reality of that family. He said, give them all the love that you can, when you can, spend as much time when you can, but respect yourself and work hard. He said, but always bring them around, let them know what you're doing, make them part of what you're doing. That's why, you know, coming to the restaurant so that they realize and uh, and he was right. You see, they 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 uh, they understood uh, that you know uh, mom had a had a job too besides being just a mom, and so spending time with them, bringing them there in the restaurant gave me an opportunity to share with them who I was, what I was doing, and uh, ultimately, even though you know uh, I I always felt you know that they need to. Uh, get a great education and have a, an American job. And they did. My daughter, she, she has a, a PhD in Renaissance Art History. My son, a master's in business. They both, they run the restaurants now. So you see, they came back to, to they didn't forget uh, what they learned as, as small children hanging around grandma, a mom and a dad. That's so awesome. We have just a bunch of really great questions coming in from everyone. Thank you so much for sending us questions. So let's just start in on them. I love this one. It's straightforward from Maria in Burlington. Lydia, what is your favorite thing to eat? Ah, Maria, pasta, pasta shoota, I love. And not even fresh pasta, I love dry pasta. I just, you know, yesterday I made a, a, a bowl of spaghetti and a tomato sauce uh, uh, and a little bit of oregano for grandma and I. She ate a bowl full, I did, and it was so gratifying. So give me a good bowl of pasta, especially if you're giving me linguine with the clam sauce. I like that. That sounds delicious. I want that. Um, and then from all the way from San Diego, Isabella 
Isabella, we have all these Italians writing us, Maria, Isabella. Um, do you think that plant-based cooking will become a bigger part of Italian cuisine? Uh, Italian cuisine, a big part of the Italian cuisine is plant, is vegetables. I mean, you know, we eat an awful lot of vegetables and uh, uh, not as much protein, a little bit, I guess, because uh, uh, it's more expensive or whatever and vegetables, everybody grows. But if you, uh, uh, an Italian meal usually constitutes uh, of the plate, one third of the proteins and two thirds between the vegetables and the legumes. So I think, will it ever be all vegetarian? Uh, you know, I guess some part of the population will do that, but it's not, uh, you know, it's not a cuisine that does a lot of, uh, a lot of proteins, a lot of meat. I think that what happens here when you go to Italian restaurants or restaurants in general is that um, uh, I think that value is measured by the proteins when somebody goes to a restaurant or whatever. So if you get a veal chop that's kind of a mountain high, uh, that's good. But that's not what happens in Italy and that's not Italian. So it is more sort of translated into the contemporary, where is the value on a plate? When you go to a restaurant, what am I paying for? And everybody focuses on the protein. Yes, that is a really good and interesting point. Hadn't thought of. Uh, so from Paula in Johnson, Vermont, um, she says, what is your go-to red table wine? Huh. Well, you know, I think it, it depends uh, on what I am eating. You know, the spaghetti that I had with tomato sauce, a nice Chianti would be, would be wonderful. Uh, you know, I think they just marry well. If I have a brasato, uh, you know, a nice piece of meat or some truffle, of course, I would go to a Barolo uh, up in, in Piedmont. Uh, you know, I come from the Friuli Venezia Giulia region up in the right hand corner. And we actually have a winery where we make Bastianich wines, you know, and you can go and check them out on, on the website. Uh, and we do make uh, wonderful red wines. The, the uh, local varietals are like Refosco. Schiopettino, uh, a good Merlot also in that area, in Cabernet Franc. So these are the red wines of that area and they're kind of um, feisty red wines, you know, a lot of young tannins and whatever. And, you know, I like them. I like the, when they're aged properly, I like those wines. So it, it makes, you know, different, what's the season? Uh, where are you? What are you eating? Uh, it, it all makes a difference. But you know what? I love red wine, all of it. <laughs> I actually poured myself a little because I know you often drink some while you're cooking. Absolutely, good, salute, cheers. Um, all right, uh, this is a, a great question from Sandy. I don't know where that person is from, but uh, how about some hints for feeding only one person, one diner? Uh, Sandy, yeah, that, that's not, it's not always easy to cook for one person, you know, unless you kind of uh, 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 focus on uh, one chop or uh, one hamburger or one breast of chicken, you could, but you know, uh, that's when the problem comes of cooking. So here more than ever, incorporate veg vegetables in your cooking. So if you're cooking that breast of chicken, don't just sear the breast of chicken and then cook the, the broccoli separate or whatever. Make it kind of a little bit sauce, uh, everything in, in the pan. Uh, so, you know, what I would do is you saute the protein first and you, if it's chicken, you don't want to overcook it, you take it out and then you put the vegetable with zucchini, some scallions, uh, some some onions or basic of, 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 of garlic. Uh, you put you can go into the direction of white wine a little bit, a little bit of olive oil, white wine, or you can put a little lemon juice or a little bit vinegar, you know, vinegar and, and chickens go good together, vinegar. And so, so combine, make that one pot your whole meal and, and uh, just keep the timing of the protein. Do not overcook the protein. Now, if you have a pork chop, I would, do, I would begin with that 
little pork chop, season well the chop, you know, and slowly, don't not high temperature, kind of all caramelize it on both sides, and then add to it uh, maybe a little cipollini onions, maybe some mushrooms, maybe small pieces of potatoes, and you let that, you cover it, let it steam a little bit, then uncover it, let it get it nice and crispy. And, you know, you make one pot whole meal for yourself rather than, you know, uh, worrying about that lonely piece of chicken in the pot by itself and then the broccoli separate, pull it together. That sounds delicious. So we have a couple questions um, about specific vegetables. So maybe I'll put those together, but you wouldn't necessarily cook them together. So Bobby in Milton wants to know what are your favorite things to do with artichokes? And somebody who was unnamed says that they are new to cooking fennel and keep getting it in their farm share. And what is a good way to use fennel? So oh. artichokes and fennel. Yeah, they're, they're two very Italian uh, uh, vegetables. So the artichokes, uh, I think they're out of season now. So, but, uh, you know, I like them when they're small, when they're uh, uh, the smaller artichokes and I clean them uh, and I leave a little bit of the stem and clean the outer tough leaves and cut the tips off. And then I like to braise them. So I put them all, and I put them sometimes upside down, you know, with the, with the, with the stem up. So they're all kind of standing in the pot down. I put white wine, a little bit of lemon juice. I put garlic, I look, put pepperoncino. I put butter, oil. I put uh, uh, um, garlic, that wine, yeah. And uh, uh, a little bit, you know, not too, too much wine, maybe a little bit of, of water just, and then you cover them and you let them simmer and simmer and simmer and cook. And if it's not reducing, uncover them and then let it go. So it, it, you cook them until uh, kind of the, 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 the stem and, and the heart and everything is, is tender. And if they're small and if you cleaned enough of the tough leaves outside, you can eat the whole thing. And th those are delicious. Then of course, artichokes, you know, the small ones, you can even raw, slice thin and toss in a salad. I like them like that. Uh, the little bigger ones, I like them stuffed with a good uh, bread stuffing cheese. I put chopped eggs in that parsley, uh, sometimes even a little chopped anchovy. And I s uh, sort of fill them in between the, but I clean them first, you know, fill them in between the leaves. And then I roast them again with a little bit of white wine, lemon juice, pepperoncino, garlic, all of that. You cover it with foil, let it cook, cook, and then uncover it and let it get crispy. Now, uh, fennel. Fennel is, is, you know, it's a great vegetable. You can, uh, two ways, raw fennel's in a salad. So if you do that, I like it very thin. You cut it in half, clean the tough uh, outer leaves, cut it in half, uh, take the, 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 the heart out, the, the tough kind of core out, and then slice it very thin on a mandolin. And then I like to put it in uh, ice water and becomes very crunchy and, and sort of almost curls up. And then you dress it with, with lemon, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, uh, little bit anchovies, you can do a little bit of anchovies, lemon, olive oil, pepperoncino, it makes a delicious salad. But I also like uh, uh, fennel when it's really thoroughly cooked. So you, you cut it in half again, uh, take a little bit of the core out and make a thicker slice, a little thicker slice. And then you put them on a roasting pan and uh, uh, oil, salt, pepper, uh, pepperoncino, and uh, uh, just a little bit of uh, uh, white wine and you let them roast the oven, not too high temperature, 350. Let them get nice caramelized on one side and caramelized on the other side, and it's really sweet and delicious. There's a fennel recipe, a salad in the Felidia cookbook that I've been wanting to make that sounds, oh, it's oh, fennel yes. Asian pear, right? Yes, yes, that's Asian pear. And, you know, you would say regular pear, but, you know, Asian pear is crunchy, whatever. So, you know, I, we play around a little bit with, with, with other cultures' products. Why not? And, yeah, that's, that's the thin fennel that I told you. You put it in the water, let it crisp. You do the same with the Asian pear. You, pear, you core it and then thin sliced, and then you toss that with some lemon juice and olive oil, 
and fresh pepper and some uh, uh, pecorino cheese, some pecorino cheese or grana padano cheese also, shaves of that. And it's as simple as that and it's delicious. Needless to say, we have several holiday questions. So um, two questions about baking maybe. Well, not yeah. So Amy in Burlington asks, what is your favorite Christmas or holiday dessert? And then we also have a question from Lisa in Shelburne who wants to bake and send biscotti to family all over the country. And do you think they will hold up in transit for a few days? And she says she loves your recipes. So okay. holiday dessert. And then if you want to send gifts of biscotti to family, do you think that is- Okay, let me talk about the biscotti. Absolutely biscotti. That's biscotti twice cooked. So they come nice and, and crunchy and, and they're, they're dry. So they won't go bad on you and they will travel very well. And, you know, you can make all kinds of biscotti with different, whether you do it cherries with cranberries, with nuts, with almonds. So absolutely get those biscottis going uh, and uh, package them and send them. They will keep, biscotti keeps for a month and more. No problem. So uh, uh, holiday, holiday, uh, holiday dessert. Uh, you know, of course, we, 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 we are known for our panettone, which is, you know, uh, but panettone is difficult to make. So it takes a good panettone, it takes six to seven risings, you know? It really, yeah. So you want to get it very kind of frothy, if you will, before it bakes. And then it bakes nice and light with the raisins in there. And now they have all kinds of things in there. Uh, and then of course we have the fritole or the zeppole, the fried dough, which we do for, for, for Christmas. Again, we put raisins in there. So the fried dough with a little bit of sugar at the end, that's very common. We do the chiacchiere, which is the bow ties, the fried bow ties also. Uh, that's a holiday. And these are the frittole, the chiacchiere. These are all, these are cookies or in a sense, uh, desserts that keeps because, you know, uh, the holiday time, uh, people go and visit. And uh, so you, you, it's not that you buy and then it's what you have at home. So you have boxes of these cookies uh, at home. And when people come, uh, you, you, you sort of divided. We up in Friuli Venezia Giulia, we do a gubana. Gubana is, uh, is a yeast dough, and that's almost entering into Eastern Europe, you know, where you like a coffee cake. But anyway, it's a yeast dough, and we chopped all kinds of nuts, dried figs, uh, raisins, uh, cinnamon, a little bit of clove powder, sugar, cocoa, and all of that, and then you soak it with grappa, you know, and so you, you roll out this dough thin and you spread this, this filling on it. And then you make like a roulade out of it, a roulade. And then you roll it around like a snail and then you bake it. So that's, that's a gubana. And, and that's another uh, dessert that keeps. And so it could keep for even two weeks or three. So if guests come, you make a few of those and you pull one out, you cut it give them a little bit of grappa. So that those are the desserts that are traditional. Uh, but I happen to like fruit desserts. So I love my apple strudel. I make apple strudel around uh, Christmas times and everybody loves it. <coughs> Excuse me. Do you make your own strudel dough? Yeah, wow. it's simple. Oh. <laughs> no, it's simple. You know, it's flour, it's uh, uh, water, oil, and some salt. Very simple. Uh, you know, the, the ratio, and it becomes uh, a very stretchy dough, and it doesn't, it's not sweet or anything. It becomes almost, to be a good uh, a strudel dough, it's almost like phyllo. It's not phyllo, but it's almost like phyllo. I know my grandmother used to roll it in that, and then she used to roll it on the table and let it hang off the table so it would stretch some more. She wanted really thin. That's so cool. So, um, do you have in your family particular holiday traditions and will those look different for you this year? Um, somebody did ask that question and it was also a question that I had, so. Uh, I think, uh, yes, you know, the table will look different. Usually we're 25 or more and uh, it's not gonna be so this year, you know. It's uh, my mother and I and uh, uh, 
maybe a friend of hers that's also by herself will come over. My daughter lives one block and a half away. So we have to see how this Christmas is going to fare. You know, could we get together and eat? Otherwise, you know, for Thanksgiving, what I did is that I roasted a turkey. My daughter, who lives two blocks away, did all the vegetables. Uh, and uh, uh, my grandson did the cranberry. And so we, we, we split the turkey. Uh, I, I carved it for her, put it in a roasting pan, made the sauce on the side, and she took it home and brought the vegetables to me. So we kind of exchanged and shared, you know, but uh, we were not together because, you know, uh, her son uh, came from, from, from Boston, from college. And so the kids from, from coming from college, you just don't know. And, you know, my mother is 99 and I, we didn't want to take any chances. Right, that makes sense. Um, we have a couple questions from folks about pandemic cooking, right? Which we dealt with a little bit earlier. But so um, Amy from Burlington says, any tips for how to avoid getting burned out on home cooking? <laughs> she says 10 months into the pandemic and I'm sick of my own cooking. And then Carrie in Virgin says, any suggestions on how to make cooking less stressful? Uh, I think so. Yeah, I think it's a state of mind too. You know, just think about cooking as something uh, that you're creating, that you're giving. It's a way of nurturing the people that you love. It's a way of sharing your emotion, your passion. And, and I don't think that there's anything better than sitting at the table all together. Make sure that you make it a little ritual. You don't need to make big setups in the, in the, in the kitchen, but set up that little table in a sense, sit all together and do have maybe a little glass of wine, make it a little bit kind of convivial and uh, and cook with your heart because you know what do they like get your family involved you know does your daughter like to do baking so okay what's the dessert you work with has something and uh, you know i i think uh, it's it's you, you you don't have to only do the recipes that you have been doing venture out a little bit Go to lydiasitaly.com, plenty of recipes. Use some of my simple recipes and try to vary it, you know, pasta, rice, soups, not, you know, not always the same, you know, just make it different, make it, make it exciting. Uh, there's, you know, there's some great vegetables to, to be had out there. I mean, I do try not to go out there and shop as much uh, as I can, or if you get it delivered, if you belong to one of the farm uh, you know, get excited about what you get and, you know, discover, like the gentleman that asked about fennel, you know, he didn't know how to fennel. Fennel is delicious. Look it up, you know, see what fun you can do. What could you like to do with fennel? I think that could all be a challenge. So be positive because it's a beautiful thing. You're doing a beautiful thing for your family to keep it together and make that table happen. The most important place in your whole house is that table and when everybody's at the table enjoying the meal. That's great. Um, here is a very specific question um, from Patrizia. I hopefully I said that right. You um, did. He would like to know how do you make, here's another one, zuppa di pesce? Zuppa di pesce. Zuppa di pesce means seafood soup and it varies, you know. The whole coast of Italy, whether you're from Genoa uh, down to Sicily, uh, to, to Puglia, to Calabria, everybody makes a different kind of zuppa di pesce, but it is a, a fish soup. So, you know, I mean, uh, our, mine is, is simple. It's, it's a question of, you know, which and how many fishes you do. So I think some shellfish, clams and mussels are fine and good. Uh, I think some some shrimp, some crustaceous of some form, or you know lobster, or however uh, luxurious you feel like having, and then also some white fish, but a little bit more meaty fish, like monkfish is good, scallops are good, and and so you have to make sure that you don't overcook the fish. So first, what you do is I like to make my my kind of marinara sauce. You take some. Uh, uh, San Marzano sauce, uh, tomatoes in the can, not gonna have to be, uh, and you kind of crush them, get the, the whole San Marzano tomatoes, don't get the crush because you don't know what they're crushing there. And so some uh, garlic, 
olive oil, crush the, the tomatoes, you put it, put it in, and if you have fresh basil, some fresh basil, some peperoncino, and you let it cook for 15, 20 minutes, and it is done. Don't overcook it. Then you have that done. Start with your, with your uh, fish. So first, of all the fish that I mentioned, you go with the most substantial, which is the monkfish. Monkfish is, you know, the one that kind of uh, is, is more so. Uh, I like to put a little salt, pepper, a little bit of flour, because the flour sort of then cooks into the sauce. So, so brown it in, in the oil, nice and gentle, first the, uh, uh, the, the monkfish, and you pull that out. Then you do uh, the scallops, brown those, and you pull them out. Then you do the, uh, uh, let's see, the scallops, the, 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 the monkfish, uh, if you have, if you have um, the lobster also, I like to sear the lobster tail a little bit so it doesn't fall apart. And then you're ready to go. So you can have your zuppa di pesce, just the garlic and the marinara, or you can put some onions. But you put back into that pan the monkfish, you put this, the scallops. These are about the same cooking time, and you... you douse it with white wine. You let that kind of uh, uh, perk up a little bit, get the alcohol out of there, and then you take your marinara and you add that to it. This is all quick because super de pesce doesn't take long. Full speed ahead, a lot of fire, so be careful you don't. And then the last thing, so make sure that the seasoning, the peperoncino's there, the oregano or, or, or basil, whatever you want, and then you add the, the clams, which take a little longer to, to, to cook. Then the, the, the shrimp and the mussels, which take about the same time. And you, whenever you add these, this different, you cover them so that the steam builds up and it cooks. And when the clams and the mussels are, are cooked, opened, then the rest of the fish should be cooked. The marinara is, turns into this delicious zuppa di pesce with all the liquid from the seafood. Some, some grilled bread on the side, you got yourself a zuppa di pesce. I'm so hungry right now. I want that now. <laughs> <laughs> Yum. Um, a couple questions about um, you, where you find inspiration. Um, Joanne from Milton says, who is your favorite celebrity chef? Do you have one? And oh, Sandra I... <laughs> says, oh, what you. cookbooks do you own that inspire you? So do you get inspired by other people's cookbooks or other chefs? All the time, all the time. I love to go. I have a tremendous library. I'm, uh, I love my, my cookbooks. Uh, and not necessarily do I have to go through all of them, just having them around me. They give me this kind of uh, stimulus. And, and, but I do. When, you know, uh, when I, uh, I'm into, even ethnically, you know, if I'm into the French, of course, and Jack and all my, and Daniel and uh, uh, all these, these chefs, I have all of their books and I admire all of them. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so the inspiration is, uh, you know, it's, uh, yes, the books, the products. I just am so stimulated when I see great products. If I go to a fish market and I see a the beautiful eyes of a fish just, you know, live or, or an octopus, or, I want to buy it all. I want to buy it all and I want to cook it. I want to, you know, to serve. So the products uh, stimulate me also. And, uh, and also I get a lot of inspiration, especially when I go back to Italy, maybe because it's reminiscent of my grandmother, because, you know, um, uh, and, and I'm going to tell you a little bit my story right after I'm finished this so that they understand. So a little bit of my, my, my rem remembering my grandmother and my connection to, to uh, grandma's cooking and great aunt's cooking, all of these, the, the ladies that carried on the cultural tradition of who I am. And when I was small, they taught me. And I still get very uh, stimulated, if you will, if I get into a go through Italy and end up in a little trattoria or in a home with a woman, simple woman with her little slippers and her apron in the kitchen. I just, you know, and usually those foods are so straightforward, they're so simple, but yet there's something that I pick up, either, whether it's the, the spice that they put in or the herb that they put in or the combination that they do. do. So I am very much stimulated by, 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 I guess, by all of those. You know, you have to just uh, uh, open up and 
accept all that in and then you process it and you make meal. Now, my philosophy of cooking is not about Lydia's cooking because it's not. You know, a lot of chefs today, star Michelin or whatever, it's about them. They're, ta they're talented, they're artists, they're wonderful. You know, but it's about them in by inventing things. I, I uh, Melissa, I don't, I don't invent. I, I am a conduit, if you will, of my uh, birth culture, of my native culture, and transporting it to my adoptive culture because I came to the United States when I was 12 years old. So, so, and I realized how much Americans love Italy and Italian food and whatever. And I said, and my friends and everybody at home, they wanted us to cook. And uh, I loved cooking. And, and so that's how my, my, my history was born. But my passion for cooking, and now I'm gonna tell you the story on, on goes, goes back. And so I was born, and that's all part of my biography. I was born in Istria. Istria is no longer Italy. After World War II, Istria and Dalmatia were given to the newly formed communist Yugoslavia. Italy lost the war and we were from Istria. So the border went up, the Iron Curtain went up and we remained behind the Iron Curtain. And life was not easy, it was tough. You know, the food, uh, you had to different language, uh, you couldn't go to church and many different things, but specifically food uh, was scarce. So uh, my mother, she, she is a teacher but she put my brother and myself in a little country town with grandma so that we wouldn't be in the face of this regime, if you will. Uh, but we lived a more tranquil life and we did uh, with grandma. And she had all the animals. We had pigs, we had ducks, we had goats, we had rabbits, uh, we had uh, a beautiful garden. Grandpa made wine, grandpa made olive oil. And I was part of all of this, all of the seasonality. In, in November, end of November, you know, the, the slaughter of the, of the, of the pigs, the, we made prosciutto, we made bacon, and all of these sausages. I was involved in all of this as a child. And, uh, you know, grandma would use me, carry this, bring this, help me, help me make the gnocchi, help me do this. And I would cook uh, with her along, you know, I would go pick up uh, the vegetables, the potatoes the potatoes, warm potatoes out of the ground, you know, in my hands, I can still recall. And uh, uh, when my parents then, in, that was in 1956, decided that uh, they could no longer uh, raise us under these condition. We had relatives on the other side of the border because part of it was left here, part of it was there. And so my mother, my brother and I, we went supposedly to visit a sick aunt because they wouldn't allow the whole family. And about two weeks later, my father escaped the border, joined us in Trieste. And then I realized that we were not going back. So I didn't say goodbye to my little animals, you know, I had my, my friends, my grandmother. And uh, there was always something longing in me to finish that, to, to you know, I wanted to go back to say goodbye. I wanted to, to be with grandma again. And uh, that's when I started cooking because cooking for me brought grandma to me, the flavors, the aromas, the all of that. And I loved cooking and in, in her honor, you know, uh, in, in my aunt, great aunt in, in Italy, Trieste, she was a great cook, I cooked with her. But cooking became sort of, uh, um, for me, a refuge, a, a, a comfortable place to be, a place where I felt good and comfortable and the smells of grandma and of those wonderful years that I spent with her and the animals were all there. And so I think that, you know, my passion for cooking was born like that and I continue, I still do. And cooking is a way of expressing myself, my emotions, my thank yous and so on. That's such a beautiful image. And in fact, we had a question um, which you kind of just answered, but Rebecca in South Burlington says, food makes us remember place and time. <laughs> and what are some of your favorite recipes? Maybe one from your childhood? Well, you know, we all know that sometimes we are in a place and an aroma hits us and it takes us completely to a place that you never thought about. It's, it's a very strong, uh, you know, the olfactory is a very strong uh, sense 
and it it gives us it makes us travel through our time uh, and remember it. So so uh, you know uh, um, the 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 foods that I and I still cook. I cook a lot of the foods that I remember. Whether it's gnocchi, whether it's stripe, whether it's you know the one. Okay, I will tell you one uh, uh, dish maybe that maybe you haven't even heard of, but we loved it. And as a kid, and I just made it last week for for my brother who loved it. And that was, you know, gnocchi, you know, with potatoes, but we had gnocchi with suzini, gnocchi with plums. And so when, when, the, the, when the fall, uh, sort of the summer into fall, you know, the plums are nice and ripe. Mm -hmm. So grandma would make gnocchi dough and she would make the gnocchi with the sauce for everybody. But for us kids, she would take the dough and fill, make like, like around, around, like just, round maybe an inch and a half right and she put one uh a prune the prune the fresh prune pitted she put a little bit of sugar in there and she would just enclose it and envelop it in this gnocchi dough and make a little bowl a little ball and she we would roll it would roll it and then she would cook it just like the gnocchi so she would throw it, it would take a little longer to cook because there were you know the fruit inside had to cook but uh, uh on the side in a pan, she toasted breadcrumbs in butter. And when that was toasted, she closed the fire. She added cinnamon, ground cinnamon and sugar, and she just mixed that. And so she, when, the, when this gnocchi, the sozzini, these balls of gnocchi were, were done, she would take them right out of the boiling water and roll them in this breadcrumbs and then they would stick all over uh, the gnocchi. And uh, that's uh, gnocchi di Susini. It's something that, uh, you know, that area of, of Italy. And I think it's also part of Austria they do because that's Austria-Hungarian used to be also there. And so, so uh, that's one of, one of the, when, when you put that in front of me, you know, you take me back to a place and time. That's awesome. I think that might answer Isabella's question to a favorite dish from your region, which I cannot pronounce. Uh -huh. um, so, same, yes, maybe. Yeah, one of them, absolutely. Gnocchi de Susini. But there's, there's. All right, we, we, have... do, we do a lot of, we do a lot of, we cook sauerkraut too up that way. Mm. Yeah, yeah, we do. You know, Melissa, I, I cooked for Pope Benedict and Pope Francis when they came to New York, and so Pope Benedict is German, and uh, so you know, I'm comfortable with cooking sauerkraut. Yeah, and I think your roots are in Eastern Europe, so. You know, you 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 might be familiar with the, with cooking sauerkraut, but I decided that I was going to do for him some sauerkraut, some spetzels, some strudel, all of these things of this north, and and uh, he loved it. He loved it. That sounds delicious too. Everything sounds delicious. All right, we have a couple pretty specific questions, so maybe this will be so from a second generation Italian, Georgette. She says, "I love your torta di ricotta." but she doesn't have enough people coming over right now to make the whole thing. Do you think she can do it in smaller, two smaller size pans and give them to friends so that they can oh, abso share? Absolutely, absolutely, you, you could. You just have to be careful about the time, the baking time and whatever. And uh, uh, you know, if you put it in wide, they'll spread and they'll be, uh, flatter, but that's okay. You know, it's, it's perfectly okay. Just don't overcook them. Okay. And she wants to know if she can freeze them ahead of time. Uh, you know, freezing ricotta, you could freeze them. But what happens is that uh, the, uh, the water, I guess, in the ricotta freezes, makes water crystals. And then when you defrost it, it's watery. It becomes mm. watery. It's not... Uh, it's not as maybe creamy as, as uh, so you could freeze it, but it, you, you expect a little bit different texture. Okay. And then uh, Babs, um, she says, when she was a kid in an Italian family, we called my favorite pasta perciatelle. Perciatelle. Oh, that. <laughs> she <laughs> says, um, I think she's saying maybe she cannot find it. Is it similar to bucatini? It is. It's similar to bucatini. Perciatelli maybe are a little fatter, but you could you could get the bucatini. And all it is, it's a it's a, a little fatter spaghetti with a hole in the middle. And uh, you know, there there 
they're fun to eat. As kids, we love them because the sauce would go in there and then you eat and you slurp them up and they would kind of uh, squirt the sauce in your face or whatever. So we had fun with it, uh, but it's, it's a nice texture, you know, because pasta, and we have, I don't know, but more than 300 different shapes of dry pasta. It's, it's a lot about the texture too and the mouthfeel and all of that. So, so perciatelli are, are, are good, absolutely. Mm. Um, and then Pauline wants to know if you have any tips on meringue. She says hers always seem to shrivel. Well, yeah, I think it's whisking it is one thing. Put a little bit of uh, cream or tartar. Don't overdo it too fast. You know, let it be nice and solid. And then you have to bake it very slow, you know, at a slow temperature. Because what has to happen, it has to dry, you know. If 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 uh, uh, there's the, the the liquid that's left in there, there well, that's when it falls down. So it has to dry. So do it nice and slowly. Bake it for a long time in the oven uh, uh, at, at a lower temperature. Okay. And then um, Jeb has a question. He says, "Do you pay attention to the heat of the pan when using olive oil?" I'm guessing maybe he's talking about not making it too hot or? Well, olive oil, yeah. Of all the oils, olive oil has the, the, the lowest smoking point. And uh, that is that it'll break down and smoke uh, at a, a lower temperature. So if you cook him with olive oil and you begin to heat the pan, chances are that the olive oil will smoke. So if you want to get a crisp finished on something or whatever, uh, use either canola oil or vegetable oils. They have higher smoking points and they will give you that crispiness on that uh, fish skin that you want crispy or whatever you want. Don't use the olive oil. I do that, uh, even the chicken, when I want to brown the chicken or whatever, and I want to, I brown it in vegetable oil. Then I discard that. And in the mm -hmm. same pan, I add a little bit of the olive oil and I begin to do the actual cooking. So when you ingest, you ingest, you know, the olive oil, which hasn't been altered uh, because, you know, if you, if you, if you raise the temperature, the, the bonds uh, are kind of tighten up and it becomes more difficult for you to digest. So lower temperature uh, for, for the olive oil is best. You see me adding olive oil a lot at the end. Uh, because, uh, you know, olive oil, it's, it's expensive. And what you love about olive oil is the taste and the aroma. And if you're heating it at high temperature, you lose all of that. It's sort of, you know, uh, uh, the flavonoid disappears. So you, you don't want that. That's why adding olive oil at the end, you don't alter, you don't change the, the chemical composition of that olive oil and you maintain a lot of the flavors and all of that. So, you know, if you want high temperature, use the, the canola, the vegetable oils, the, the, the sort of high uh, smoking point oil, then you can discard that once you got the, 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 the and, and then you continue with olive oil and in the sauce that you're going to eat. Um, our torta di ricotta question person has a quick follow up. Do you know the recipe well enough to estimate how many smaller spring form pans would be equal? to the basic recipe you have? I think the spring form that I have there, it, it must be maybe about a 10 inch. Um, so, so uh, you know, you don't, you don't have what, uh, you, the spring forms, I think eight inches, the smallest that the, but you know, maybe, maybe the little uh, tartlets or something, you know, you, you can be creative, fine doesn't have to be uh, a regular spring form, although, you know, to get it out. So, so you could make it in even in little tartlets, you know, just be careful, don't overcook it. And, you know, the tartlet is, is low. It's not, made, if you have one with a higher border because it, the cheesecake rises and it might go over. So, you know, I think it's, it's maybe nice that, that uh, she tries uh, different ways and a tartlet, but just be careful it doesn't, uh, it's it's high enough, and a tartlet maybe not fluted because then it gets in the nooks and crannies, and you'll have difficulties getting it out. Maybe a, a, a simple, uh, uh, you know, um, 
I, I think some, something like that. And I think what could be also also nice is, you know, you can almost do it like in a pie form. If you do, uh, you can do a, a, <clears throat> a graham cracker crust. Uh, you know, in some recipes I have it, some recipes I don't. I'm not sure which one she's looking at, but because you can do the cheesecake without, I just put breadcrumbs sometimes and that's the crust. But if you do, if you do it like, like in a little pie form or whatever, you do a little graham uh, cracker crust, and again, be careful because the cheesecake rises and then it falls. So it doesn't uh, kind of spill out. So we have, I think, time for one final question. And we got a couple really good ones from uh, my friend, uh, Baker Martin Phillip of King Arthur Flower. He's an amazing guy. And he asked how you, you talked a lot about the roots of cooking coming from very field to table back in Istria as a child. How do you approach that living in Queens? How does that relate? Well, I do have my own little garden here in Queens and in, in season we, uh, we have, and I've had it, I mean, I'm here 30 years and we had the gardens for 30 years. So that need for, for going out there and getting you know that fresh herb or that fresh tomatoes. I still have in the garden uh, some carrots. Uh, so so and some uh, radicchio I still have. So that's one way. But uh, that was one of the problems uh, when I first came uh, in the United States. You know, and first I was uh, young and you know with my mother we would go shopping. And I was amazed by the grocery stores and everything they had and everything was packaged and everything was so delicious. Yodels, uh, uh, those, 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 all of this, you know, as a young kid. But then slowly you begin to realize, you know, that that's, that's you know, I'm missing something else. And uh, so, you know, I would go to the markets as much as I could. I know that I, we would take rides in those times, go out on Long Island to the farms, go upstate to the farms to collect. Now, luckily enough, uh, the farmers are coming to the cities, uh, you know, and they're being, and, and it's so wonderful because, you know, we need to buy those things. We need to buy from them so that they can continue to produce these things. <clears throat> And even in the stores, you know, when you shop in the stores, buy uh, food that is genuine, that, you know, it is uh, pasture, you know, the pasture raised uh, uh, beef or, or uh, egg, uh, the chicken uh, uh, free roam or something like that. Uh, these, this is the play, things that we should buy and invest our money in real good food. Then, you know, because big industry is big industry. They're there for money. And if you're buying junk, they'll continue to put junk on. So, so buy good stuff. It costs a little more uh, so that we can support those farmers. And we can tell big, uh, big stores, this is what we want. They will change. They will change slowly. It's, you know, you cannot change quickly. But it has been uh, great to see the big change that has happened in, in America in the last 20 years, you know, as I said, I'm in the restaurant business 50 years, but in the last 20, 30 years, slowly, you know, it's, it's been wonderful to see the appreciation of good, fresh products, seasonal products, local products. And look at the, all the great cheeses you have up in Vermont, you know, it's, it's wonderful. Oh, Lydia, thank you. Uh, that just flew by. We're at an hour and I just want oh, to right. say thank you so much for joining us, for taking the my time. My pleasure, my pleasure. I'd like to thank all the viewers, all of those that join us and those that continue to watch my show. And uh, uh, thank you, thank you very much for having me. And yes, it flew by, you know, when you enjoy what, I guess what you do, what you talk about, uh, it, it flies by. So thank you for having me. Thank you. And thank you audience for so many great questions. And of course, to our sponsors, Stowe Kitchen, Bath and Linens and Healthy Living Market and Cafe. And the talk will be archived on the Vermont PBS YouTube page. And of course, you can watch Lydia's Kitchen on Saturdays, 1130 a.m. on Vermont PBS and on Create. And the new special, Lydia Celebrates America, a salute to first responders will be premiering in January. Okay. Thank you. And I don't Ciao, know how Lisa. Say, how do you, you say that at the Salute. beginning? Salute. 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 <laughs> Salute. Salute. Salute.